Hi, comrades, viewers KVF. The second class in the PO guide will be presented by Srimadhi Kritika Paramasiva. I request all to observe the classes minutely so that whatever questions comes, you can very easily answer. I am requesting Kritika to present her presentation. And welcome you all to the second class of this post office guide part one. So in the previous class, we discussed all about the control and the organization uh, of the department. And we will discuss the furthermore, the next next classes in this session. And welcome, I welcome you all to this second session. So now we'll move on to the presentation. Okay, now I'm uh, commencing this second class. So in the previous class, we, we learned in depth and detail about the organization. So we have covered only one class in the previous, the entire class. So now we will move on to the second class. One by one we'll go. So the second class deals with the, uh, it speaks about the types of post offices. So generally, if any question, if you receive how many types of post offices are there, we have three types of post offices in our department. So one is head post offices and the second is sub post office and the third one is the branch post office. So generally in common, in, in common, we have three types of post offices. That is the head post office. The second is the post office. And the third one is the branch post office. So the first two classes of offices will normally transact all types of postal business. So generally all types of postal businesses uh, will, will, be there in, uh, will, uh, will be there in the first two classes of offices. That is in the head office and the sub office. And uh, the facilities of uh, provided in the B was the branch post office is in a restricted manner. That is, nowadays, all kinds of services is also available in the branch post office. But some uh, in some services, it will be in a restricted manner. So this is all about the types of post offices. Apart from these uh, major categorization of the post office, we also have it another uh, kinds of office that is, a first class head office. A first class head, head post office is nothing but head offices which is being located in more important cities uh, and it will be in charge of gazetted offices. So generally um, head post office will be headed by any higher selection grade postmasters. But this particular special type of head offices will be um, the gazetted offices will be in charge of this kind of first class head office. So generally, some head office in some important bigger cities will be categorized in this category. So the first class head postmaster will exercise all the powers of a superintendent of post offices of an office. So generally, the, the priority and the, the rank of uh, the powers of the first class head postmaster and that of a divisional head, that is a superintendent of post offices, will be of the same. So the main thing you have to, you, you all have to remember is that what is a first class head office? So generally important um, head shows in some important cities will be termed as first class head office and the first class head postmaster will have the powers of a superintendent of post offices. So, and then now we will move on to the fourth class that is the mobile post offices. So the name itself speaks. The mobile post offices are nothing but they are the moving post offices. They will be in mobile. They will be moving post offices running in any mail vans or any other vehicle that has been set up by the department. So these uh, mobile post offices has been exclusively, exclusively set up in order to provide the facility of even the late posting. Even after the letterbox clearance, the public can rush to these mobile post offices and they can post the letterbox which has been located in this mobile post offices and they can go. So generally uh, these offices have been uh, formed in order to meet the postal requirements of any new settlements and also to provide late evening booking facilities to the public. So what kind of uh, uh, transactions that the mobile post office can offer? This is the main thing you, you need to study. So these mobile post offices will generally sell uh, sell stamps, all the postage stamps and stationeries, and they can even book uh, registered articles, air parcels, 
um, apart from accepting the ordinary unregistered articles, they can also sell stamps, stationeries, book uh, registered articles, air parcels, and, and all. But one very important thing you all need to remember is that this mobile post office cannot book insured and value payable articles. Very, very important thing. So question may be like whether the mobile post office can book following these things. Now, option will be like stamps um, and then registered articles, insured VP. And there will be options like choose one and two, one, two, and three like that. So you have to keep this thing in mind. So mobile post office can book register can book air parcel but it cannot book insured and vp so excluding insured and vp so that is why we have highlighted the same please keep this in mind and uh, mobile post offices which has been located at madras and nagpur they are also even permitted to book the money orders so i repeat mobile post offices uh, they are generally the moving offices set up at any vehicles and uh, they will be, and, and one thing I forget to mention, these mobile post offices will be closed on Sundays and holidays. So question will be like whether the mobile post offices will function on Sundays and holidays. The answer is absolutely no. So they can sell stamps, stationeries, book registered articles, uh, air parcels, um, and it can also accept the unregistered articles for dispatch, but it cannot book insured and VP. So this is the main things in this mobile post offices so the next thing is about the general post office this is also one kind of offices gpos so the general post offices are the first class offices normally situated in the circle headquarters so generally um, this is a type of first class office but this will uh, generally be situated in the circle the headquarters of the circle we have learned now in the first class we have learned all the 23 circles and its headquarters, right? So they will be located and situated in the circle headquarters. So there are 26 general post offices functioning in these 23 postal circles. So in for 23, we have three in extra. So we have 23, uh, 26 GPOs functioning in the 23 circles. So two GPOs are functioning at Delhi, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Odisha. Other persons will be having one one GPOs, right? Okay. So this is all about the GPOs, the general post offices. So the next thing will move up. Uh, the third class of the PO guys, the very, very, very important one in the examination point of view. So you cannot, it is very rare to see a question paper without a question in this sector, in this area. Uh, so night post offices, the class three, NPOs. In short, we can call it as NPOs. Uh, so the name itself suggests no the night post offices so the night post offices are set up to provide late uh, uh, late uh, service to the customers right so generally the working hours of night post office will be fixed by head of the circle i repeat who will fix the working hours of a night post office means uh, head of the circle in other words chief postmaster general so generally, a night post office will work from morning 10 a.m. to evening 7 p.m. But uh, one can um, um, extend these working hours of NPOs up to 8.30 p.m. That is, generally it will be working up until 7 p.m. But we can extend the same even up to 8.30 p.m. But the director general is the only authority to grant such extension of working hours to a night post office. Okay, and also, so I repeat, generally the working hours means the head of the circle will fix. But the extension of working hours of a night post office will be granted only by the director general. So only a director general can order a night post office to work to extend up to 8.30 p.m. and also keep them open on Sundays also. Now we are going to see what are all the services that we can offer in this extended working hours what to do and what not to do during this extended hours. So during this extended hours, that is from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., the night post offices can book registered articles, uh, including VP. It can book registered. It can book VP articles. It can book EMOs. It can sell postal orders. And it can also sell postage stamps. Okay, during this extended hours. So what are all the things that we can do? We can book register. We can book value payable articles, 
money order booking can be done uh, postal order sales could be done and postage stamp sales could also be done but what not to do during this extended hours so even there is booking facility available uh, in this extended one and a half hours so what not to do no deposits in savings bank account so generally night post offices will be accepting savings bank transactions only up to 3 pm so during these extended hours no savings bank work will be done and uh, this will be only up to 7 pm generally up to 3 pm and during sundays and holidays only if the director general as i told if he permits the night post offices can work with the restricted working hours that is only for one shift that is from morning 10 am to evening 5 pm that is from 10 hours to 17 hours but even in the sundays and holidays no delivery will be there the delivery function are entirely suspended and no payment of money orders and no savings bank work in these sundays and postal holidays so i repeat since this is an important topic and i'm repeating this once more so now the night post offices generally working time will be fixed by the head of the circle that is the chief postmaster general and the extension of working hours will be fixed by the director general that is up to 7 8 30 pm from 7 to 8 30 it can be extended only by dg and keep them open on sundays during this extended working hours what can be done registered booking vp booking emo booking sales about ipo postage stamp what not to do no savings bank will be there in this uh, in this extended hours and during sundays and holidays only restricted working hours for that is for, for one shift from 10 to 10 am to 5 pm and during the sunday no delivery and no savings bank work no payment of money orders so this is all about night post office make sure you are thorough and master in this night post office and then we'll move on to the next clause that is clause number five this is about business hours what is the business hours of a post office so uh, generally in any post offices the reference uh, and any inquiries being made by the customer and the sale of stamps and stationeries will be carried out during the entire hours so whatever the working time of an office for the entire working hours one has to sell stamps and stationeries and any customers reference and inquiries must be done and also now coming to the booking point so booking of registered insured vp will be done for six to seven hours in the normal day and on saturdays it will be for about uh, it will be restricted to five hours i repeat booking of registered insured and vp generally a normal day six to seven hours and on saturday it is restricted to five hours so the the window delivery of of uh, all the registered insured vp is also the same as per point two so the booking also the same time and the window delivery of the registered insured vp articles and payment of money orders is also generally six to seven hours and on saturdays it is only up to five hours and then coming to the financial thing that is like uh, booking of money orders uh, postal orders and the savings bank work will be done in normal days the counter will function up to five hours and in Saturdays, it will function only up to three hours. And in respect of branch offices, the minimum working hours of a branch office now is that of four hours, and maximum working time is about five hours. So I repeat, generally reference inquiries, postage stamps, and stationery sales will be of entire working hours. Booking of that registered insured VP also six to seven hours on Saturday, five hours window delivery of the same which we discussed in the point two the same six to seven hours and on saturday five hours financially related like money orders ipo savings bank generally five hours and in saturdays three hours do's minimum four hours and maximum that of five hours so this is all about the business hours and the next clause clause six is a deleted clause so after five we are switching it to clause seven clause six is a deleted clause now we are moving to the seventh clause seventh clause is about the business done on sundays and postal holidays so what are all the business and what are all the transactions that can be done in a post office during the sundays and holidays so except night post offices and uh, rms the railway mail service okay sometimes all the post offices are closed on sundays and holidays i repeat except the night post offices 
in terms of offices i am telling except the npos all the post offices are closed on sundays and holidays and during these sundays and holidays there will be no clearance of letter boxes letter boxes will not be cleared it will be retained detained delivery of mails will not be there during this holidays and days and everything will be there so th this is about post offices now coming to rms the railway mail service no so one can post letters uh, in the rms also because rms will be working around the clock right or uh, they'll be having schedules as such so one uh, a customer can post the letters uh, in the letter boxes in the rms offices uh, after paying the necessary late fee so generally the late fee of unregistered articles is two so they have to pay postage uh, in addition two rupees has to be paid in addition to the normal postage like uh, likewise the late fee for registered articles is rupees three so for i repeat for unregistered two rupees will be the late fee and for the registered article three rupee will be the late fee so such postings such posting um, in the letterbox of rms and mail mail vans can be done uh, after necessary posting of late fees so if necessary late fee is not being paid then it will be detained and it will be uh, dispatched only under the next schedule so this is one important thing and uh, uh, registered newspapers generally late fee has to be paid uh, for rms but registered newspapers book packets um, and uh, posted on sundays and holidays uh, will be uh, posted without any late fee only in press sorting offices uh, rms that is press sorting offices or the offices which has been set up in the premises of a, any press so in only in such press sorting offices registered newspapers will be accepted without collection without any addition of the late fee for normal articles late fee has to be paid but only in this uh, types of press sorting offices the late fee need not be paid by the customer so this is all about the business done on sundays and po holidays so the eighth clause which you are going to now discuss is this is about seventh seventh is nothing but what are all the business that can be sundays and holidays and by who so only npos can work work in sundays and holidays no letterbox clearance no delivery nothing in rms one has to give late fee one has to pay the late fee but for press sorting offices one need not pay the late fee very important thing and uh, now coming to the post office holiday clause number eight post office holidays so generally there are 17 postal post office holidays is 17 holidays are there for the department of post so i repeat how many days are there 17 holidays are there post office holidays are there so among the 17 holidays three holidays are nation holidays as we all know so August 15, January 26, Republic Day, and October 2nd, Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. These three are the national holidays, and these are common to everyone, each and everyone. And apart from these three national holidays, there are 11 holidays. 11 holidays are the common holidays, and they will be common throughout the nation. For across the nation, these 11 and also the, the above three, the national holidays will be of common. So 14, 11 plus 3, 14 holidays are common to all the uh, officials working in the department. But there are three holidays which are optional. And this will vary from circle to circle based upon their own religious um, occasions. So there are three holidays which, which can vary from circle to circle. So these three um, optional holidays will be uh, generally decided by uh, convening a state um, central government coordinating committee so every year one state uh, central government coordinating committee will convene and they will sit and decide um, the common the optional holidays which can be took by their own circle so these will be decided so i repeat totally 17 holidays are there three are national 11 common holidays and three are optional so this is all about the post office holidays now we will move on to the next important sector um, that is one another important topic in this PO guide part one that is the ninth clause the ninth clause is about the desirability of payment of postage so how one customer or any individual can offer their 
how can how they can give their uh, how how they can pay their postage so one can pay their postage in the below three ways so one can pay postage through postage stamp or else one can pay the postage through franking and also there is one more option for payment of postage that is a prepayment of postage by cash so there are three ways in which customer can choose or opt to pay uh, any postage for a uh, for any letter or any article so now we are going to discuss this one by one in detail so first we'll begin with the postage stamps as we all know the postage stamps are uh, generally issued by department of post under the direct authority of government of india right so um the whatever postage they need, want to pay they can pay in the form of postage stamps so generally unpaid or any insufficiently paid articles will not be afforded any greater security in transmission and such articles are liable for detention and also for the purpose of taxing so one has to properly pay the postage needed for that article so post office apart from the postage stamps it is also designated it is it can also sell the revenue stamps also these revenue stamps cannot be used for payment of postage and they these revenue stamps are manufactured by the state government for the revenue purpose postage stamps are for posting purpose and revenue stamps is for revenue purpose right okay so in order to cater the needs of philatelists and stamp collectors the department of post has set up the philately bureau at a uh, many important principal post office so philately is nothing but the hobby of collecting postage stamps so at present as on 31 3 2019 there are 84 philately bureau in the in the department and uh, one who wishes to collect these kinds of commemorative stamps um, in the philately can open a philately deposit account so the fee for domestic opening a domestic philately deposit account is that of 200 rupees whereas uh, for uh, overseas international philately deposit account the fees is about rupees 1000 so i repeat generally stamps are printed at two different printing press one is situated in nasik the other one is at hyderabad the domestic philately deposit account the cost of it is rupees 200 whereas the cost of international philately deposit account is rupees 1000 now we are moving to the 11th clause the very very important point in examination point of view that is the franking so what is a frank what is franking so a frank machine is um, an electronic or any digital it is a stamping device uh, so the the frank machine will affix uh, stamped impressions on the postal articles so this is all about franking the second type of uh, offering the postage stamp is franking so generally there are two types of franking machine in the department one is the older one the electronic franking machine that is the efm and the second one is the remotely managed franking machine that is rmfm so nowadays at present only the remotely managed franking machine has been put to use so the electronic machine franking machine is the older version but we will learn both for uh, for the examination so first we'll see about this electronic franking machine so the efm the electronic franking machine is a, as i told earlier this is the older method uh, in this is um, one older method in which the manual credit of the amount will be um, is being carried out earlier so this is the older time and this is not being carried out now in that uh, earlier electronic franking machines the impression will be in red color the stamping impression the impression will be in red color and this electronic franking machine it contains two types of die one is value die and the other is license die and as i told this electronic franking machine it, uh, it it is a manual process the credit and everything is since it is a manual it is a time consuming one the amount will be loaded manually everything will be taken care of manually so the intervention will be much so this is quite inconvenient to the uh, to the department so so department has now abolished this electronic franking machine and now the recently been used franking machine nowadays is this remotely managed franking machine so some of you might have seen this franking machine in the 
uh, head post offices or any business post centers. This RMFM, uh, that is RM remotely managed franking system is the currently being used franking method. Now we are going to see about this RMFS in detail. So this remotely managed ranking system has been introduced by the department with effect from 16 8, 2010. I repeat, the system of RMFM has been introduced with effect from 16 8, 2010. So as I told her, the electronic franking machine, the impression will be in red color at all. But for this remotely managed franking machine, the frank impression will be blue color. That is a bright blue color. The impression will be in bright blue color. And though the this RMFM has been introduced with effect from 16 A 2010, from 1 7 2013, department decided that only the articles frank through this RMFM system will be accepted hereafter and no more electronic franking machine red impression will be taken hereafter. So even though it has been introduced in the year 2010, department uh, strictly enforced that only after 1 7 2013 only the articles franked through this uh, frank plus machines that is nothing but this rmf machine will be accepted from users and the earlier red impression will not be accepted in the postal department now we will see so the generally the remotely managed franking machine will be used by any government departments or any individual or any commercial things so the who will be the licensing authority for this remotely managed ranking system? So the licensing authority for individual and commercial license will be the respective divisional head, whereas the licensing authority for the government departmental license will be that of regional head. I repeat, for individual and commercial license, divisional head can himself sanction the license for such persons. Whereas for any, if any department is approaching for the franking license, the regional head is a competent authority to grant license for them. So this is very important thing. Now let us see what are all the features, what are all the uh, features of this remotely managed franking machine. Generally, this RMFM will generate a secure 2D barcode. So you can see in this picture. So this generates a 2D barcode which contains all kinds of um, uh, information that has been required in connection with this letter. So, frank impression, uh, the blue color impression will indicate all of the things. What is the class of an article and what is the pin code, um, where it has been book, booked, in, and then um, the authentication code and the date of the, the date at which this article has been franked. And then the license identifier number, the frank value, everything will be denoted in this 2D barcode. Everything will be there. So now let us uh, let us go through the licensing process. So generally, one one any customer or any department, those who want to use this franking uh, machine, they will generally buy a Digi Frank Plus machine. The name of the that machine is called Digi Frank Plus machine from any OEM. The OEM means the original equipment manufacturer. So this is not like uh, you can buy from any uh, any retail outlet like that. One can buy franking machine only from these originally equipment manufacturers. At present, there are three OEMs in India that is uh, Pitney Bowes, Neo Post, and Frama Systems. In Frama Systems is most more rare. Generally, Pitney Bowes and the Neo Post are the OEMs, those who are supplying Digi Frank machine to our uh, vendors, like, like uh, the, the commercial purchaser, like that. So what is the fee for getting a license for this franking? So the franking machine user has to deposit a license fee of rupees 375. Very, very, very important point. So the fee for franking, for obtaining this franking is that of 375. And the validity for this 375 rupees is for five years. So the, the license fee is that 375 and it will be for five years. So the and the, it this applies for any franking machines uh, licensing authority. So the licensing authority will 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 carry out all the prescribed verification and generally license will be granted within fourteen days from from its application. And if any renewal has been applied, that will also will be granted within five working days. If not renewed, the fees for that refund will be 
given within 30 working days. So generally, licensing process one, what you have, you have to keep remember uh, OEM. So what is OEM? Originally equipment manufacturer, and very importantly, the license fee, 375 for five years. So grant it will be granted within 14 days, renewal in five days, and if not renewed, the fee will be refunded to the customer within 30 working days. So how are the credit process? As I told earlier, in electronic franking machines, since manual credit is being carried out, it, it has been very tough to make account of it. Whereas R, in RMFM, uh, the deposit funds, any through any cash or check or any net banking um, is authorized, can be paid at any authorized bank of State Bank of India or all, and also through the e-payment credit. We also have the e-payment credit to deposit the funds to the RMFM. So the Department of Post will receive all the credits either from the state bank server or through this e-payment method through SFTP. That is the secure file transfer protocol at the end of the day. Everything is online. We need not, we do not uh, interfere with anything else. So every day, whenever the customer deposit some fund to this franking machine, the Department will of Post will automatically receive the credits through the so through this file transfer protocol okay so the department dop server will update the credits and it will reset the same to it once again so this is how a credit process will will be carried out since this process so since no manual interference has been taken taken in this method this process is very fast convenient and very very secure so next one what are all the credit conditions for this franking machine uh, fund so customer after getting licensed, the customer has to pay a minimum of 2000 at the first credit. Very important point. The license fee is, as I told, 375 for five years. And the customer, one day, if very soon, as soon as he got his license, he has to go, he has to pay a minimum of 2000 as a first credit in any state, state bank of India branch or through e payment facility. On the subsequent recharge, after the first recharge, the subsequent recharge can be done at rupees 1000. And then multiple 600. So the research may be done across the post office counter and also through the India Post website. So the machine, the franking machine, needs to be reset and then it has to be credited. Whenever the meter falls to the country, whenever the value of it uh, falls even below 100, the credit has to be done. And um, after five years, the renewal will be done for license, right? The renewal will also the same 375 for five more years. Renewal of license has to be done within one month before the expiry of license. For example, say if the if the franking machine user the uh, the license has been expiring in this October, the customer has to make the renewal in the September itself after five years in one month before expiry of license. Failure to do so if if they fail to um, renew the same within um, even before one month of expiry, so an additional charge of rupees. 100 rupees will be levied as penalty for that one. Uh, after three months, even after three months of expiry, uh, if one is not renewing the same, the license will get cancelled and they have to apply for the license afresh. Okay? So this is all about credit condition. The main thing to remember is 2,000 in first credit and subsequent recharge, 1,000, minimum 1,000 and multiples of 100 can be done. Whenever machine falls 100 and below, we need to reset the same. Renewal has to be done one month before the expiry. If if uh, if, if it is failed, uh, five, 100 rupees will be collected as a penalty. And even after three months, if there is no renewal, the license will get cancelled. They have to uh, make it the application fresh. So the next thing, the each machine will call uh, has to call to the server. Uh, server is nothing but the server will exchange the data between this system and the server. So each machine has to call the server at least once in 30 days. Otherwise, the machine will be blocked and you cannot frank it further. And the machine will start functioning only after dialing to the server. And this dialing facilitates and scanning the details between the server and the and this particular machine. So uh, after franking, if one has to post the letters in our post office, uh, the licensee, or his messenger should produce the window delivery ticket. So very soon after giving license, we will also give the window delivery ticket. With this window delivery ticket is nothing, uh, nothing but like an identification card. In order to identify the customer, the firm, the company. So each and every machine has to call the server at least once in 30 days. Otherwise, 
a machine will be blocked and it will start functioning only after dialing to the server. And every user or any department, those who receive this franking license will be provided with a window delivery ticket. This window delivery ticket is nothing like nothing but like an identification card. In order to identify, we will be giving a window delivery ticket. So the post office, so the customer will come with a window delivery ticket and they can come the post letters in a regular manner. So the post office will generally maintain two registers for this franking purpose. One is the office record book. It will record all the franking details in this book and the daily docket register. In the daily docket register, what are all the uh, articles we are daily, we are uh, franking in the machine, it will be noted in the daily docket register. So there are two registers. One is office, office record book and the other is the daily docket registers. So the remotely managed franking articles, it shall be posted only at one office, I repeat. In, in the previous, uh, formerly in the electronic franking machine, one can post their articles at any two. There will be two designated offices. But remotely managed franking machine has to be posted only at one office that is true at the designated post office which has been allotted to them. Maximum three times the franked articles can be posted in a day. They can, they can give in batches. So, so uh, the, in the morning, they can give one batch. In the afternoon, they can give one. In the evening, they can one. So, maximum three times a franked article can be posted in a day in that particular one office which has been designated. This is very, very important. Question will be like, in how many post office can a licensee can uh, post their franked articles? So, only at one office. So how many times can they post? Maximum of three times they can post. And yet another important point in this franking machine is that machine franked articles should not be posted in the letterbox. If a franked article is being posted in the letterbox, it will be treated as unpaid. I have to. So it has to be properly, safely to be handed at the counter only. A machine franked article should not be posted in letterbox. Very, very, very important point and they will be treated as unpaid articles. So this is a very important thing. And then coming to the franking machine commission. So the there is commission has also been there for franking. So uh, what is the maximum limit uh, or to be frank means you can frank up to any value, any value provided if you have the amount in credit in your account. So generally the commission will be of 3%. 3% commission is permitted as a commission for value of franc used and uh, additional 2% will also be given for pre-sorted bundles. If the customer sorts the articles according to the PIN code and if they give, we can also give an additional of 2% commission to them. But there is a limit for this commission. The threshold limit for this commission, for paying this commission is 5,000. Even if you, if you, uh, if, uh, if the commission is being calculated about 5,000, they will limit the same to 5,000 rupees. I repeat, 3% in normal, 2% for additional uh, pre-sorted bundles, and the threshold limit is 5,000, uh, 5, right? Okay. So as I told, the credit will automatically upload it whenever the franking machine calls to the server. And, uh, and it will be reset automatically. That is all about franking. We have seen several things about this franking. Each and every line is very important. Starting from this abbreviation, when it has been introduced, and who is the licensing authority, each and everything is very important, especially the license fee and valid for uh, that fee. Each and everything is important. So make sure you 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 master this. You you have to be very very thorough in these franking, especially for PA examination. There will be definitely a question in this franking area. So the last class, twelfth class of this uh, class is. Clause number 12, prepayment of postage in cash. The third one. So we have seen about stamps, right? Second one, franking also we completed. The third category, prepayment of postage in cash. So in some offices, in some bigger units, the head of the circle may authorize uh, to receive the postage charges in the form of cash from any individual or any customer or any firm um, to who, who can, uh, that is the bulk one who can post a minimum of 500 articles at a time in big cities and 250 articles in small towns. So whoever is capable of posting uh, 500 articles at a time in big cities and 250 articles in small towns, they can opt for this prepayment of postage in cash. 
This facility is available at selected ISATOL, selected gazetted officers, and selected higher selection grade officers. Okay, um, and they will grant this only to the business establishment who post not less than 500 articles at a time in respect of letters, ILCs, and postcards. So, so this method is not for everyone. So, for only for in order to facilitate the bulk customers, we can also provide prepayment of post agent cash. So, this is all about the second class of PO guide. So, see you all in the next class. So, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So, thank you all and thank you, sir. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much. I hope this class will be very useful for the candidates who are appearing the examination. We will meet in the next class. With this, today we are concluding. Thank you very much. We will meet again.